We wanted to find out how best to support children who've experienced maltreatment. We know a lot about the risks that young people face and the many harmful outcomes of child abuse and neglect. But these harmful outcomes are not experienced by everybody. Why do some children show resilience in the face of adversity? And what can we learn from these children's lives? We don't know enough about what helps protect and support children who've experienced abuse or neglect. And we know very little about the services, environments and relationships that may continue to support people across the course of their lives. Thanks to funding from Oxford University's ESRC Impact Acceleration Account, we brought together experts from children's health and social care, from local government and children's charities, and researchers from the humanities, social and medical sciences. Together, we wanted to share and discuss evidence for what best supports young people who've experienced adversity to thrive. One of the key things from today's workshop has been the commonality uh, of thought uh, amongst the group. We come from a very diverse set of backgrounds and uh, uh, everything from ac uh, academics to practitioners. I definitely think that we could work more collaboratively in the future. Um, I feel like charities can become quite isolated in terms of the work that they, they do and can be dictated by the funding that's available rather than actually looking at what research needs to be done and providing the evidence and saying actually we need to do work here. We want this to be the start of ongoing conversations and collaborations so that research asks the right questions and can be translated into relevant and useful answers. We're really interested in childhood adversity and trauma because one in three enduring mental health conditions directly relates to childhood adversity. But we also need to better understand how those early changes um, can be recalibrated. So how can we understand recovery, resilience and malleability? What factors promote that? Uh, and that involves studying resilience and not just risk and poor outcome. One of the most important questions we should consider when we're, we're thinking about children who face adversity is the context in which they are growing up, their neighbourhoods and the sort of spheres of support and relationships that they find critically important, be they within the family, domestic sphere, but also the neighbourhood. And the actual, well, the evidence that we now have to show that children and young people are quite astute at understanding who's got the resources, emotional, psychological and financial, to support them and that they will seek out those supports that can be robust. So tuning into those a bit better. I think what's most important in understanding how best we can help children and their families is understanding how we can best relate to them, how they relate to themselves, how they relate to their parents, how those parents relate to professionals. So it's not just saying, OK, well, you've got to 18, that's your service ending. This needs to continue because trauma takes its time to come out and show. And sometimes someone may look like actually they, they're not traumatised. And then 10 years down the line, it really comes out and they, they haven't got that support anymore because they're, they're over the threshold. And it's usually linked to age rather than actually where they are in life. All of us have a role to play in not only tackling childhood adversity, but also promo promoting children's mental health. So that doesn't mean we need to wait until it turns into a symptom that might become a psychiatric diagnosis. We need to upskill frontline professionals like youth workers, social workers, teachers, so that they can intervene at the very earliest stage. The biggest issue to address, uh, to reduce the number of children facing adversity is to be working far more collaboratively across all of the stakeholder groups. That's uh, local commissioners, children services, clinical commissioning groups, investors and voluntary organisations that provide service. But also working more with practice and, and policy and local authorities um, to try to make sure that our research is, 
is reaching the right people with kind of decision making power. There's a wealth of literature and data from history we need to take into account. If we ignore that, then we are dealing with the situation we have now in isolation. The main message I'll be taking back to uh, my colleagues will be um, to reinforce our thinking about the, the, the need for workforce development. And by that, what I mean is that the professionals who are working with children and families feel sufficiently confident to be able to work with them and to meet their needs. And that we avoid the situation very often where if something crops up as a problem, um, the, the case is referred on and to really try to enable uh, professionals to work confidently and competently with those children and families where they have the relationships that those children need. What I'm going to take back to Young Minds is that not only do we have some fantastic supportive colleagues in academia, but actually by working together we're going to get on top of this. This was the start of a conversation. From our discussions we identified some key messages First, we all agreed on the importance of working collaboratively across disciplines and sectors. We need to keep working out the best ways of doing this in practice. The UK has centuries of experience in investing in children's lives. This history can help us to think imaginatively about the key relationships, environments, resources, actions and interventions that support children to thrive. Frontline workers, such as teachers, youth workers, counsellors and community workers, are often best placed to support children and young people when they're experiencing difficulties. We need to better equip all professionals and practitioners to feel confident in dealing with the challenges that people face following abuse and neglect. And finally, all research, policy and practice must be centred around young people and the unique knowledge, insight and lived experiences that they bring. These young people are best placed to help identify what does make a difference.